it real quick. Um, pretty impressive that so many of you are here. I'm happy that I have some of my voice left, and it's my team is very uh, is making fun of me. That is actually possible possible for me to talk too much. <laughs> so this is probably what's happening. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome uh, Yehuda uh, today, and I'll just leave uh, the stage with him. So give him a big hand. Okay. So hey, so uh, thank you everybody for being here so early in the morning. It's at least hard for me, I don't know about everybody else. <laughs> um, so my talk today is uh, called Why Rails is Hard, and uh, the motivation behind this talk is that there's a, I feel there's a trend in open source today, and I think it's largely driven by the emergence of JavaScript uh, entering our ecosystem. I'm, I'm very... So I think uh, there's a, an emerging uh, mentality that the only kind of good software is small and simple software, and if your software is doing too many things, it's de facto automatically, by definition, bad, wrong. Uh, you're doing it wrong. You should be writing small, decoupled software that does one thing and does one thing right, uh, is I think the nice version of it. But really, it's, it's just a, a backlash against software that does more than a little tiny thing. Um, and so I'm, I'm personally not a fan of that movement in general, and I definitely see it creeping into the Ruby community, and so my talk here is, so, is I've heard, I go, I give talks a lot, and usually someone in the audience asks a question like, why should I use Rails in the first place? Why shouldn't I just, since I'm only emitting JavaScript anyway, why shouldn't I just switch to Node? Um, or Sinatra or something like that. And I, I think these questions come from a heartfelt place in, in people's heart. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, but I th for me, as the person who worked on Rails and works on Rails for a, a, a lot, uh, what strikes me is that there's a lot of things that Rails does behind the scenes that nobody knows about, and that's a good thing that nobody knows about it. But unfortunately, we do such a good job hiding the complexity from people that they assume that there's no complexity there at all, and it's just a lot of code doing a lot of nothing. So the, the idea behind this talk originally was just to give a, a, a bunch of vignettes that show you things that Rails is doing. Um, it turned out that I only am able to talk about two things, so there, you could think of them as two case studies. But the idea is to talk about things that you probably didn't know about exactly. You might have heard of them, but you basically maybe don't know about what exactly is going on behind the scenes. Um, and in one case, to show how it compares with what other frameworks are doing. So you might call my talk, uh, Why Open Source is Hard. Hey, my thing is not working. There we go. Uh, why Open Source is Hard? Because this general uh, problem, this general question applies just as much to the work I do um, on other projects as it applies to Rails. Um, in general, I try to solve end-to-end -end problems, so Bundler is a good example of this. I don't try to solve the small problem, and I'll, often I take flack for having a library that's not 500 lines of code, um, but I, I think there's a lot of utility in actually trying to solve problems from the end-to-end. -end. So today I want to talk about um, why it is that Rails specifically, what some case studies in Rails, but the lesson that you hope, I hope you take out of this is there's a lot more going on in the libraries that, I, that we use every day, and don't assume that because there's bulk to a library that it's useless bulk. Um, so I want to start with a somewhat famous quote from Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, there are no known knowns, these are things that we know. We also know that there are known uh, unknowns, that is to say there are some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns, that is, <laughs> there are things we do not know, we do not know. And for me, that, sorry, that list of things is divided up something like this in a uh, Rails application. There are a series of known knowns, things that everybody knows that they have to do. Uh, I have a web server, it serves JSON, sounds good. There are some known unknowns, uh, which are things that you probably have heard of but don't exactly know how to solve and you hope that your framework solves them. Uh, security is a good example. You hope your framework is secure. Maybe you don't want to have to figure it out on your own, but you hope it's secure. And then there's unknown unknowns. These are things that the framework is doing for you, but you didn't have to know that they existed in the first place in order to get the, frame, the benefits of those things. Um, so I'm going to talk today about the second and third category. Um, what you do as a normal Rails developer is actually the first category. It's the things that you need to do in order to get your job done day to day, today, 
And that's actually the smallest part of what Rails does. It's the visible part of what Rails does for you. And it's the part of what Rails does for you that you could easily imagine porting over to something like Sinatra or Node. So you're looking at the surface area of, of the API part of Rails, the part that Rails says, hey, here is how you generate JSON. And you're thinking, I could do that somewhere else. And I don't really want to talk about that. We, we all know how to do that. And that's, that's our day-to-day -day work. Um, I think Sinatra or Node developers usually spend a lot of time in the uh, known unknown space. It's, um, my app needs to be secure, so I'm going to go try to figure out how to do that. Um, there's, a, there's a series of things like this where you know that this problem exists, and now as a Sinatra or Node developer, you need to make sure that you have imported the middleware or whatever that solves that problem, or the library that solves that problem. Um, and then there's a whole other, this is where I spend most of my time, um, in the space where hopefully if we're doing our job right, you have never heard that this problem existed in the first place. So the known knowns are basically, we have a web browser, the web browser makes a request to some web server, the web server talks to a router of some kind that usually is in your control, the router goes to the app, the app returns some HTML or JSON, goes back to the router, goes back to the web server, goes back to the web browser. Um, so in the Ruby world, your server is usually passenger or unicorn, your rail router is the Rails router, your router routes to the Rails action, and this is actually, I think, when I'm just building a Rails app, if that's what I'm doing on any given day, this is largely how I think about what Rails is doing. So it seems like these things are basically equivalent. But, like I said, I'm not really going to talk about this because, in fact, for this, those particular public-facing things, they are pretty similar. What I'm going to talk about today are two case studies of things that are in the other categories. So the first one I want to talk about uh, is an example of something that is a known unknown. And that is CSRF protection. So how many people have heard of CSRF? So keep your hand up if you know how CSRF actually works, how the attack works. Keep your hand up if you have like a, a if you could explain it clearly what the mitigation strategy is. Okay, good. Um, so that's what, I, that's what I mean when I say it's a known unknown. Everybody knows that it's a category of thing that you would like to protect from. So when you go to build a Rails app or a Node app or a Sinatra app, you're gonna be, most people will, look for a checkbox that says this thing solves CSRF somehow, but most people don't know enough about how the attack works or how the mitigation strategy works to know whether the thing that you're using to solve the problem actually solves the problem or not. So, for example, because everybody knows that you have to solve the CSRF problem, the Express framework in Node uh, ships with this thing called Connect, which has a CSRF middleware. So there is this thing called anti-CSRF, and because what most people know about CSRF is you have to solve it somehow, they tell you, you put this middleware in your app, and then now, allegedly, you don't have to worry about CSRF anymore. Um, unfortunately, if you look at the documentation, it's a little bit more complicated than that. They tell you, make sure you put the middleware somewhere below your session and cookie parser because it requires session support. So already, the uh, having to understand what's going on has increased. You have to know that it does something with the session. Not super bad, although I'm personally not a major fan when I'm working on applications of having to set up my own middleware stack, but that is a thing that people do in Node and Sinatra a lot. Um, and then what's, I think, more problematic is that the documentation say it does, uh, this middleware doesn't actually do anything to get the token in your form, so it basically says, make sure to add the token CSRF to your requests um, somehow, and then in the documentation they basically show you, like, go gsub out, like, go get the request body, gsub it out, replace like squiggly token with the token that you get out of the session. Um, I don't actually, so maybe someone later, not now, could school me on why node people are getting the request.body and replacing it. That doesn't seem very node-like to me. It seems like you would want to use some kind of like async thing, but um, I guess that's what people do. And uh, there is a problem though with both of these uh, documentation slides, which is, in general, in security, you do not want to enlist end developers in framework security. If you have to enlist end developers in framework security, you have basically already lost. Um, there, you can see an example of this with the reason mass assignment brouhaha. The reason why the mass assignment brouhaha existed was not because an end developer could not make Rails secure. In fact, it was relatively straightforward for an end developer to make Rails secure. The problem is that Rails was enlisting you, end developer, to make Rails secure, and everyone is bad at that. Um, so basically, uh, in general, this is the general Rails rule, and the reason why we took that mass assignment vulnerability seriously, even though historically, apparently, we have not, is because this is actually the rule, right? You don't actually enlist end developers in application uh, in framework-level security. You have to actually make it work. So, that, so this, this is sort of the intro. Now I want to 
talk about what CSRF is so that you have a better understanding as I walk through the rest of these slides. So imagine we have this controller, we have a cash, we're a bank, we have a cash transfer controller. Please, if you're a bank, do not use this code. It seems bad. Um, so first we authorize the current user with the parameters. We make a new cash transfer object and we push it onto some queue to actually go do the cash transfer later. In general, you are not going to want to be doing cash transfers or sending mail or whatever on the main thread. Uh, and I want to point out here, this is not a mass assignment vulnerability. We are at, the first thing that we're doing in this action is we're authorizing that the user is allowed to do the right thing. So imagine we have some code somewhere that checks to make sure that the parameters are correct. So we basically make sure the parameters are correct, we make a new cash transfer object from, from account to account and the amount, um, and the authorized bank is probably using the current user method. So you are, as a, as a Rails developer, you are relying on the current user method being correct. So how does the current user method get there? So the first thing that happens typically is your browser is going to post a request. So you, your user is going to go to a login form, type in their username and password, hit enter. The browser is going to post a request to the action, which let's say slash yacht login with the username and password. By the way, I like, there's some uh, apps that have started putting hearts in the place of stars. I, I like that, it's cool. Uh, so we send the username and password. And then what the browser basically does is in the response, the browser returns a cookie, sorry, the server returns a cookie to the browser that says, here is some text that please, you as a browser should send me back later. Um, and I don't, this is not the real cookie. The real cookie has uh, a signature in it that makes sure that you can't tamper with it and blah, blah, blah. That, that could be a whole other talk. Um, but basically the browser now has a cookie that will, it will send later. So now imagine that we have a form which is send some money, say action goes to bank.com slash transfer. That should probably just be slash transfer. We have a from value, a to value, and then an amount of $1 billion. And this is a perfectly valid form. This is on bank.com. You want to submit it. This is, there are probably banks that do approximately this form. <laughs> and the important thing here is that the browser, when, when you hit enter on that form, it obviously serializes the from to an amount, but it sends back that same cookie that, we, that it sent, that it got from the server before. So an important aspect of web architecture is that the server doesn't actually know who you are between requests. What is called a stateless or share nothing architecture. So the server doesn't actually know who you are. The server relies on the fact that there's this cookie that gets passed back and forth automatically between the browser and the server, transparently from you as an end developer. And that's something that, uh, Rails can use on the, on the flip side to identify, okay, you are that user ID, and then it sets, typically there will be some code somewhere that is either hand-rolled or comes from like devise or off-logic or something that gets that, that user ID, looks up in the database, and populates the current user. So basically the way that that authorized bank method worked is that it was a, it identified, I gave the browser this cookie, the browser gave it back to me, I, can, I know that that's the same person. Now, the way that CSRF attack works is let's say I am evil.com. The browser actually doesn't care whether or not the form is submitted from my domain or from some other domain. So the browser, so evil.com could go make a, a form from and to amount. This is basically exactly the same form as before with a different submit text. And then go append it to the body and call submit. And the browser will go submit it to the server, but the important thing here is the browser will also send along any cookies that, that are identified as part of bank.com. And you might say, and people often say when they're first learning about this attack, like, holy shit, that's the craziest thing in the world. Browsers should immediately remove this third party thing. But you probably don't realize that, like, you might go into, like, login.37signals.com, put in your username and password, hit enter, and then you go to 37signals.com, right? Or you might go to any, like, it is extremely common on the web for people to not have the login form be on the same domain. And, and further, it's extremely common to have, like, hey, I'm gonna give you some, some HTML that you put in your site and you could use that to log into our portal. So basically the web is very entrenched in doing this sending the cookie thing, so we can't actually get rid of it. It's just how the web actually works. Um, and the problem is that from the server perspective, we get exactly the same form post that we got before. We can't actually tell the difference between the form that we got because the user legitimately went to bank.com and hit enter and the form that we got because evil.com submitted it. Now you might also say like, oh, it's not a problem. Why are you using from to an amount and uh, like a guessable URL, like just use an unguessable URL and like other, other names and then no problem. Like you, people will not be able to figure it out. Unfortunately, 
uh, people, other people can actually go to bank.com and look at what the field names are and then copy them and do the same attack. So um, it doesn't, the fact that there are guessable URLs makes certain attacks easier for certain hackers, but it doesn't actually mitigate the problem at all. So the, the mitigation strategy is that we would like to have, instead of just providing the input fields that are the same from everywhere, we need to include a token together with the form that is special, that every single user gets their own copy of. And obviously, the, the thing is that the third party cannot actually see that token. The third party has no way to see it because the browser will not let you make an AJAX request cross domain and send the cookies. So there's no way for the third party to actually get access to that ver the token that is associated with the user session. So when we actually go and submit the form, now we can check, oh, do we have the token that's associated with the user session? Yes, okay, awesome, that means it comes from me. No token means evil, we will not allow this. So that's the normal mitigation strategy. This is like, at this point, a pretty old mitigation strategy and it's what basically everybody is doing when they say that they have CSRF protection. Um, in general, CSRF protection, the goal is differentiating a post that comes from your site with a post that comes from a third party. Another side point is people think like you could just use the refer header for this. It sounds like you would be able to. Unfortunately, the refer header, I think that something like 20% of all requests or 10 something come without a refer header. So if you want to use the refer header as a mitigation strategy, you will need to lock out 10% of your users who are behind a proxy that's stripped it out or whatever. Um, so that's also not an acceptable strategy. Long term, there's like the origin header etc. that will make it easier. But this is basically the fundamental problem. How do we differentiate a post that comes from your site with a post that comes from a third party given that the browsers will happily send long cookies if you do the crazy thing where you make a JavaScript form and submit it. So that's, that's basically what CSRF protection means. Um, and when, you're, when we built CSRF protection into Rails, we basically have a few goals that we would like to achieve. So number one is on by default. Uh, many people don't know about CSRF protection, and so we will do not want every single person who makes a new Rails app to have to know about CSRF protection and turn it on. Uh, for example, Connect makes you do that. Please learn about CSRF protection and put it into your middleware stack. Uh, that's bad. Then there are several different cases that exist in the world. There's HTML forms, which are vulnerable to CSRF, AJAX requests, which are vulnerable to CSRF, which also come from a browser, and then API requests that come from a non-browser and uh, will not pass a cookie, but we still want to make sure that you can make an API request. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why uh, the AJAX requests and API requests are fundamentally different things. Um, and then finally, we actually, as we build CSRF protection, obviously the state of the art in security changes. And for example, recently, about a year or two ago, we found out that there were some approaches that used to work by whitelisting certain headers, and it turned out that there was a flash exploit that made that uh, approach unreliable, so everybody who is, does security well in a web framework had to go and modify the approach to do something different than we were doing before. Um, so that's another thing, it's just like, it is important that we keep up to date and don't use, don't say, you know, do CSRF, check the checkbox and call it a day. Um, we want to make sure that we're actually up to date. So th those are the goals. I think these are pretty straightforward and obvious goals. Um, unfortunately, the details get a little bit tricky. So what do, we, what do we mean by on by default? Not only do we turn it on by default, but it's important to avoid disabling people wanting to go disable CSRF protection. So if you go look at um, the Sinatra website, for instance, it tells you, uh, hey, Sinatra is using rack protection to defend your application against common opp opportunistic attacks. You can easily disable this behavior, which should result in performance gains by saying disable protection. So Please, Sinatra, remove which should result in performance gains. I know that your benchmarks got slower when you have to actually do security. This is also why Rails is sometimes slow, but people can live with secure but not blazingly fast benchmark uh, optimized applications. Um, and, but the problem here is that if you go look at like Stack Overflow, almost every single post where someone's like, I'm getting the error that says I can't use CSRF, one of the people that gets highly voted is like disable protection. Right? And the problem is that if you, if you make the protection too hard to use for whatever reason, then people will want to disable it. So in addition to it just being on by default, we want to make sure that it is rare that people will feel the need to go disable it. Now people obviously, you can disable it in Rails and people do, although we don't have a thing that flag that says disable all protection. Um, you actually have to go do it one at a time in Rails. Um, and we don't really advertise it. but. Um, the point is that we, when I say it's on by default, I also mean that it should be extremely rare that someone feels the need to go disable it. And what that means is that it needs to work for all the cases that are common in which people will want to have some client server 
thing going on. So the most obvious one is forms. This is the one everyone knows about and the one every single framework tells you how to deal with. And let's look at how Connect tells you how to do it. So Connect says, this is their documentation. So obviously you're, you would not make your form in line there. You'd be getting it back from upstream or downstream or whatever. Um, but if you look at the bottom over there, it says like set the header, content type HTML, and then replace the curly token with request.session.csrf. That's also what um, Django used to do, like before I think 1.1 one, one or 1.2. One, uh, unfortunately, like having to parse the entire HTML body to find tokens that you're gonna gsub out is a little bit crazy, and nobody really wants to do that. Um, there are a variety of reasons why that's a bad approach. Um, again, I'm very surprised that no people are into this. But uh, it's basically, the point is it's 100% manual approach. You, in addition to having to manually insert the middleware, you have to manually go into your application and say, make sure that the token is actually there, which should be done via like some kind of G-subbing because there's no interaction between the middleware that sets up the token and your actual application. So uh, the documentation says this is what you should do. So this is a 100% manual approach. And obviously a 100% manual approach is gonna be the most likely for people to disable or not use in the first place. Um, Django has uh, what I call a semi-automatic approach. So uh, their forms, there's no form helpers um, in Django, so they basically tell you whenever you make a form, make sure you put in the CSRF token um, helper, and then we'll make sure to put in CSRF token. So that, uh, that is good. It does not require you to know about the mechanics of CSRF tokens, but it does mean that there are a large number of people that forget to put in the CSRF token and get confused and go and try to disable the CSRF middleware because they that's the first thing they find on Google before please put, put in this token. And I think that's a thing that is really worth thinking about when you're designing an API is like, how do we avoid people from knowing about this in the first place? If people have to know about it, then there's a good chance they will try to, they will get, get into trouble, especially with security. Um, obviously the Rails approach, as that we all know, is you use a form for helper, which we always have used even before we had CSRF protection, um, which means that when we added CSRF protection, we were able to add it behind the scenes without any um, extra work from you as the framework developer, as an application developer rather, um, and we j it just got added. Basically, every website got upgraded to having CSRF protection when it became no known as a vulnerability. So uh, obviously, I prefer the automatic approach. And the good news about the automatic approach is that there aren't forms that get created in, a, in the life cycle of a typical Rails app that do not have CSRF protection. Um, and I think that's, this is a, very, a big win for Rails. Uh, the next thing is, okay, so you have CSRF protection, which HTTP methods do you need to protect? So I'm just gonna tell you the answer before I proceed. The answer is, you don't have to protect head and get requests. It would be very bad if every single time someone went to google.com, they had to say question mark CSRF token equals, right? That would be very bad. Um, and so your get request should hopefully not be making, uh, should not be doing uns unsafe things. Same with head requests. In Rails, those are the same thing. Um, and then all other things that are not head or get requests. So I'm, I'm cheating here, there's like trace and options also, which are safe, but these are the ones that people use in practice. So head and get requests are safe, post, put, and delete requests are unsafe. Um, if you go look at the connect middleware, by default the connect middleware treats everything as unsafe. Obviously nobody's going to use this in practice, nobody's going to leave everything as unsafe where you not be able to make a, you know, type the URL in the browser. So they basically, their documentation tells you to do this, basically to blacklist post requests. Unfortunately, now you're treating put and delete requests as safe. And again, unfortunately, this is app code. They're, it's basically, they don't do anything, so the default is this, and they tell you in your app, go do this, which means that a bunch of people have already copied and pasted the code, and when somebody goes and tells them, like, hey, Yehuda said this is bad, which probably someone will do, um, and they go fix the documentation, there will be a bunch of apps out there that are just stuck doing the wrong thing. They, are, they have whitelisted put requests, so you can go, any, any app that uses Connect CSRF protection is vulnerable to put and delete requests, which is clearly bad. Um, so this is basically how it works. So uh, um, in, again, this is their documentation. This is not their code. And you can see where if post does not equal rec.method, return next. And what's especially insidious about this is if you're, doing, if you're building a middleware stack, you might say like, oh, it's no problem. Like browsers don't submit put and delete requests, which unknown if that changes in the future. It has changed a few times back and forth. But more concerningly, in a middleware stack, you probably have something higher up that says like change underscore method equals put to a put request. So by the time you actually get to the CSRF middleware, you probably have already done some like mutation or you might have already done some mutation and like leaving it up to the framework developer to realize that this has happened and like, oh, it's not actually a post request because it's been mutated. Clearly, this is not the path 
Um, so, so this is a problem. Um, uh, rack protection, which is what Sinatra uses, does the right thing. It uh, whitelists the right things. Um, there's another thing, though, which is uh, whether AJAX requests are considered safe. Again, I'm just going to tell you the answer. People used to think AJAX requests were safe. They are not. Uh, you cannot actually whitelist AJAX requests. Um, there's some crazy flash hack that lets you get around what used to be considered a rock solid solution. So basically, when you are doing CSRF protection, you cannot actually say whitelist AJAX requests. This is not correct. Um, however, rack protection, which is what Sinatra uses again, whitelist XHR requests. Um, also, it doesn't seem to actually include this middleware by default, so you have to turn it on, maybe. Um, I'm not exactly sure what's going on, but uh, anyway, the form, the form um, token middleware, specifically whitelist XHR, so you cannot do that. Um, unfortunately, it, it was like a hard process for us to find this out. Like, we basically got an email on the security list from a Google security researcher, like, hey, did you know, crazy hack. Um, and we had to fix it, and Django fixed it, but um, there, is a, there has to actually be a security process in a framework that you use for that to happen. Otherwise, maybe someone heard that there was a new security vulnerability, but the chances, basically for most frameworks, once the security checkbox is checked off, uh, people don't like periodically check it. So I would recommend for people in general, if you're using a framework, you should only use frameworks that actually have a documented security process so that people like Google who are going around and like trying to find bugs actually have a place to send the email to. Otherwise, people will never know. Mm -hmm. So again, rack protection treats AJAX requests as safe, and this is bad. Um, Django, again, has a semi-automatic solution. And the Django solution is, OK, so we can't actually treat AJAX requests as safe. Please copy and paste this snippet from our documentation, hopefully you found, and put it into your JavaScript, and then everything will work. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't work because the AJAX send event is the wrong event. Uh, they need to do before AJAX, which is heavily documented on Stack Overflow, but um, not in their documentation. And this is just, this is the problem with uh, relying on people copying and pasting from documentation, is that there isn't really a good, a good way, since it's not autom automated, there's no like, here is, hey, the framework just does it for you. There's no good way for patches like that to make their way upstream. Um, maybe it's in a documentation patch somewhere, but this is still what people have to copy and paste and have to find, have to know about, um, I guess, uh, a lot of people don't use AJAX in the first place, so you basically have to like Google, AJAX, CSRF. Hopefully you'll find this and not something else that tells you to disable CSRF, which there are many of. Um, so basically, the, so this is, uh, I think what's interesting for, to me about this is that if you just, if you like got me in a Django guy in a room and we argued about this, the Django guy would be able to make the persuasive case and it would sound like it was quibbling that basically Django has CSRF protection, right? But all these semi-automatic solutions end up with something that many people fail at. Uh, many people can't figure it out for some reason or other. So um, personally, I'm not in favor of solutions that are like, please copy and paste this code. Please always remember to paste the token. Um, I just, people don't do it. You cannot enlist framework developers in this. Um, and the problem is, when we do semi-automatic solutions, we do not avoid disabling security features. And so, uh, for example, this guy says, I've searched around Stack Overflow and saw some information about turning off CSRF check from my view via CSRF exempt, I find that unappealing. So this guy knows enough to know that the Stack Overflow posts that tell him to turn on CSRF is probably not correct, but he couldn't figure out, even though it's in the documentation, he couldn't actually figure out how to do it. Someone did eventually tell him, like, do this, but by the way, don't use AJAX end because that doesn't work. You need to use before AJAX. Um, but the point is that if you search Stack Overflow, that's basically what you find. It's like, please disable CSRF. What Rails does, and this is sort of the point of my talk, what Rails does is harder but it actually works reliably and does not enlist you as a developer into doing it, is we put a CSRF meta tag in the head, and then we include, uh, we have a JavaScript include tag, which includes a bunch of sh JavaScript that we ship with, including a Rails.js file, and then we add a AJAX pre-filter, which does the CSRF protection, which extracts a token from the head and sends it. So basically, whenever you use jQuery, and the same thing is true if you use Prototype or another library that has a Rails.js, but most people use jQuery, um, so if you just make a new Rails app and use jQuery and you make an AJAX request, it will automatically send along the CSRF token. Uh, will automatically be there in forms. If you happen to have forms, it will be extracted from the head if it's in the head. Um, and this is, a, uh, I think, a much better solution because it means that for most people, they're not making AJAX requests and now the AJAX request is a whole other vector for disabling CSRF protection. Seems bad. Uh, I don't have any slides for this, but the final thing is API. So um, if you have a, a uh, action, which is an API action. Again, it would be very bad if you have to disable CSRF protection. Unfortunately, what we discovered 
um, when we were doing the, the most recent security fix was you actually can't, there's no way to actually whitelist APIs. Um, so you can't say it's an API. We don't know that it's an API because the same vulnerability that attacked Ajax also attacked any heuristic that we could use to figure out if it was an API or not. However, uh, Kaz figured out a really awesome hack that ended up saving, saving the day, which is as of Rails 3.1 or 3.2, which whenever we actually fix the vulnerability, I think it's 3.1, um, instead of raising exception when you have a CSRF vulnerability, we just clear the session. So an API request does not have a cookie in it, so that doesn't do anything, right? The API request was not relying on cookies in the first place, so the API request went through, it probably has a token as a parameter or a header or something like that, everything works great. Other people who are trying to do CSRF attacks, um, they will end up clearing the session, which has the slight annoyance factor of logging you out if someone tries to do a CSRF attack, but that's the overall uh, end result is that people have Rails apps and HTML works and Ajax works and API works and you probably didn't know any of this until I just told you all of it. And I think that's, that's the point, right? You don't really have to, it's not good for you to have to know this. It's not good for you to have to Google, I am doing Rails, Ajax, how do I copy and paste this thing? You shouldn't have to know any of this. You should just be using a thing that has secure by default, secure defaults. Um, there's a lot of other security. I could have done a whole talk just on security. I decided not to do that. Um, but there are many other cases, and I, for me, one of the most compelling reasons to use Rails when people say, why should I not just switch to Node, is there's like 50 things like this. Um, and we also keep them up to date, and you probably do not want to switch to something that is insecure. Um, so that's, that's the known, uh, known unknown. You've probably heard of CSRF, but don't really know how it works. So uh, now you do. Um, and then the other category, and I'm just going to use an example here, is, is unknown unknown. So, uh, the case I'm going to use is encoding. So people probably know like, that there's a thing in coding. Raise your hand if you know that there's a thing which is encoding. Uh, keep your hand up if you know like, what it encoding is. Okay, that's good, like half the audience. Um, keep your hand up if you like, can reason about encoding errors at all. Okay, yeah. So um, I think for most people, encodings are a thing that happens behind the scenes. It's actually very bad if encodings ever doesn't happen behind the scenes. There are definitely some errors that happen in Ruby 1.9. Um, I personally think that those errors are a, a good thing, largely, but uh, there was a period of time when Ruby 1.9 was first coming out where there was a very real possibility that every single Rails app that ever existed would have tons of encoding errors. Like, you would upgrade to 1.9 and you would just be dealing with encoding errors all day. And we did a lot of work to make that not happen, and um, this happens behind the scenes, and I want to talk about sort of what we did there, and then hopefully you will promptly be able to forget it. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is like what is an encoding? Um, and I'm going to use a little bit of Ruby syntax here, but you can, you can safely ignore the syntax, just the basic idea. So um, basically uh, what an encoding is, is just how you should represent a certain series of characters. So there's a general concept of a character, so that you with an umlaut in it, which is by the way not my actual name, um, that is a character. There is a, a general concept of a U with an umlaut in it. And usually we talk about these things in terms of Unicode, but there are, that character exists happily in, in non-Unicode land as well. And the idea of an encoding is how do you actually represent that in bytes? So uh, when we represent it as Latin 1, it's a slash, slash X FC. Uh, that's what, that, what uh, the U with an umlaut looks like. And if we represent it as UTF-8, it's two characters. It's slash X C3 and slash X BC um, represents that U with the umlaut in it. Um, I'm not going to talk about this ever again for the rest of this talk, but uh, if you want to encode it as UTF-16, you can see it's, it's just another sequence of bytes, right? So it's exactly the same conceptual characters. It's the Y character, the E character, H, U with an umlaut, D, A. But the way that you actually represent it in bytes is different. And just to further drive the point home, I typed in a char the Y character, but actually the Y character is not any less a slash X something than the um, U with an umlaut character. So you basically what you get when you look at bytes over the wires, you just get a series of bytes. Those bytes end, end up meaning something. And um, what basically happens in practice is that you, you may not, there, I guess the point I'm trying to make is there's no actual thing in this series of bytes that says Latin one, right? There's no text that says Latin one colon, here's some text, right? That is nowhere. You have to know that somehow out of band. You have to somehow know that it is a Latin 1 piece of text, or it's a UTF-8 text, or a UTF-16 text. And I think another thing that's important to note is that 
a lot of character, a lot of encodings, and Latin 1 and UTF-8. By the way, Latin 1 is a synonym for ISO 8859-1. So, um, that fits on a slide less conveniently in some cases. Uh, so Latin 1, basically, and UTF-8 both share ASCII characters. So that's why YEH and DA in those, char in those two encodings look the same, because any character that is ASCII uh, is exactly the same in both Latin 1 and UTF-8. And that's one of the reasons UTF-8 exists, is so that any valid ASCII in characters will be valid UTF-8 as well. Um, but the way that we represent things that are not ASCII is different across ASCII-compatible encodings. Now, the hard bit is that if you see a series of bytes, you see some stuff, you actually can't, it's not easy to look at this and figure out what it is. You can't actually go and say, okay, I know that that's Yehuda with an umlaut, because nobody told you that there was, that it's Latin 1 or UTF-8. And you can't, uh, it's not always possible as a computer even to guess. So we can guess to some degree of confidence if we want to constantly be running all of our strings through some kind of character detector, and that's actually what browsers do because the situation is insanity. But it would, it's optimal for us to not have to constantly run things through a non-100% reliable character detector. Um, so without more metadata, we actually don't know the answer. Um, like I said, we can try to guess what characters are, but if you, you actually can't always guess. And there's actually a bigger problem. Um, so imagine that I have Yehuda in Latin 1, which looks like this, and I add it together with Yehuda in UTF-8, and I get a string, which is both of those strings together, which totally happens. This is like a thing that happens in, if you don't have encoding support in your language or your database like MySQL, you can easily get into a situation where you just have bytes, and you just smash bytes together, and you end up with a string that looks like something like this, okay? And the problem is that what encoding is that string? The answer is there is no encoding. That string has no encoding. It is broken. It is a corrupted string. But this string happens all the time in real life. And what you end up having to do is you have to guess. You say, OK, maybe it's Latin 1. And if it's Latin 1, we, the first part gets interpreted correctly. But the slash, X C, uh, slash XC3 slash XBC, uh, that gets it, that in Latin 1, that means A with a Enya on it and a quarter symbol. So you've probably seen this on the internet. And it happens because there's mixed characters. There's even the, the browser is trying to guess, but it sees UTF-8 characters and Latin 1 characters, and it has to pick one. And so it picks, it picks, oh, it looks like Latin 1, and then you have characters that are perfectly valid Latin 1, but clearly wrong. Like, as a human being, you can see that that's clearly not Latin 1, but as a computer, for all it knows, that's what you meant. And then if you try to interpret it as UTF-8, you have the other problem. You have uh, the, the part of it which is actually UTF-8 looks correct, but the part of it that is... Uh, Latin 1 is like, that's not even a valid UTF-8 character. We, we have no idea what that is. So you could imagine an algorithm that tries to pick this apart and like, ah, I, I could see that N A with an Enya quarter symbol. I know what that is. And browsers, I think, try to do this. But like, no, this is clearly not, like, we're not going to have Rails try to constantly, like, do heuristics on strings to try to figure out what's going on, right? That's clearly not the path. Um, and this is, in case you've seen this character on the web, that is basically why it happens. The reason it happens is you have big HTML documents that have mixed UTF-8 and Latin 1 characters, probably because like someone submitted Latin 1 from a form at some point, it got into the database, but they're doing UTF-8. You like, someone typed in their name, their name was Jose, uh, they, their, their document, they like switched the encoding to Latin 1, now your database, MySQL couldn't, could care less what you give it, so MySQL happily stores the bytes in and it gives you bytes back. Oh no, now it's UTF-8, but it's wrong, it's, everything's corrupted, right? So that's basically what happens. You end up with insanity, and there's basically old Ruby, Ruby 1.8, and like PHP, and like <laughs> hilariously like the MySQL encodings page. If you go look, MySQL encodings, it's like full replacement characters, right? It's, just, it's notoriously hard to get right. So the way you normally get it right is that usually there is some information that is associated together with the thing that you're doing that tells you the answer. So in this case, uh, we get back a HTTP response and it tells us, okay, the content type is application JSON and hey, the car says UTF-8. So when you look at this piece of, these bytes that you get back, which I have on the bottom, hey, you should know that that's UTF-8. And so what a good library in Ruby will do, or Java or something else that's encoding aware, is it will go and say, okay, I, have, I know that these bytes as binary are unknown, but hey, before I give this, these bytes to the rest of the system, make sure that the rest of the system knows that it's UTF-8. And then the rest of the system will know, and we will not have insanity. 
And we have a similar situation in databases. So imagine I go and I put something into a database and imagine that I did not put corrupted data in there. Um, you can actually ask the database, hey database, what is the character set of this database in UTF-8? So now when I go get the Yehuda back from the database, I can go and I can force the code in UTF-8. And again, uh, I will do this before I give it to Ruby. And in general, the problem of encodings is a question of boundaries. There is Rails, and in Rails, we're mostly dealing with strings that we get from other parts of the system. And then there's a whole boatload of other external data that gets data in as bytes, and it is at that boundary place. That is the only place where we know the answer. So the HTTP library note can look at the headers, but like those headers are not attached to the string and passed on to the rest of the system. So the HTTP library is the one that has to actually say it is UTF-8, or Nokogiri has to say it's UTF-8, or uh, MySQL has to say it's UTF-8. And what we decided for Rails is, inside of Rails, everything is UTF-8. Now this is configurable, but I, as far as I know, nobody configures it. Um, inside of Rails, we would like all strings to be UTF-8. And this is essentially us trying to make Ruby behave similarly to how people, how Java or Python behaves, which is that inside the system, it's always a reliable encoding. And, but that means that we have to make sure that everyone on the outside of us is giving us strings that are in the UTF-8. So I'm going to talk about how that actually happens, why that, why that does not fail. And before I do that, I need to talk a little bit about how Ruby handles encodings in the first place. Um, so the first thing is that there is this thing called default external. And what default external basically is saying is, if you read uh, some data from an external source and, you, and it doesn't, you don't otherwise tell me what the encoding is, here's what you should assume it is. So what Rails uh, tells you and what usually makes sense is like, if you don't know the encoding, assume it's UTF-8 and you go file.read some, some file encoding and it's UTF-8. Um, I should note that Ruby does not default to UTF-8. Ruby defaults to whatever your operating system says and operating systems vary. So the most common encodings in the Western world are Latin 1 and, sorry, ASCII and UTF-8. If it, if it happens to be UTF-8, usually things work. If your system happens to say ASCII, might, libraries might at random not work. Um, so you typically want to be like, either setting your encoding in your system to be UTF-8, which is the LCC type uh, variable, or like in your script, setting default external, right? So you, uh, this is a thing that, I think it's actually a mistake. I think Ruby should say, if it's ASCII, it's actually UTF-8. But unfortunately, I think I, people ask me encoding questions, probably half of them are like, hey, I'm getting incompatible ASCII UTF-8, what's going on? Or like ASCII in Latin 1, and it turns out to be something like this. So because we set the default external to UTF-8, basically what that means is that when the file comes into Ruby, it's interpreted as UTF-8, and then obviously in Ruby it's UTF-8. So if we have, have UTF-8 files on the outside world, and we set the default external to UTF-8, the goal of having things come into the system as UTF-8 is, is done. We know that this is true. Um, but sometimes uh, the external files are not actually in UTF-8. Sometimes they're in other encodings. Um, you, sh you would not set the default external to Latin 1, but you can imagine like the database is in Latin 1 and it tags the file. It's like, hey, this string is in Latin 1. And again, remember the goal is for all strings to come into Rails as UTF-8. So <clears throat> what, we, what happens in Rails, is there, in Ruby, is that there's another setting called default external, which basically says like, hey, I don't actually care what encoding this is from the outside world. Before you give it to the inside world, please make sure it goes into this other encoding. And so basically what these settings mean is you have an outside file, that outside file will be parsed and interpreted as Latin 1, but before it gets sent to Ruby, it's going to be transcoded to UTF-8. And transcoded doesn't mean, hey, these bytes are UTF-8. It means actually go take the bytes, see what the Unicode code points are, and then convert it into UTF-8. And so there's like, in Ruby, there's a series of tables that know how to do this for a bunch of different encodings, and Latin 1 to UTF-8 is one of them. There's some more exotic translations that don't exist, but those are largely, uh, those are weird cases, largely. Um, so one of the things that I had to do to, uh, back in the Rails 3 days was just go around and tell people like, hey, there's this default ex internal thing. Please, as a database driver, please go make sure that you are actually honoring this default internal setting. So if you're the MySQL driver and the user happens to be using a Latin 1 database, which is the default, um, so there's a lot of Latin 1 databases out there and it's not acceptable for Rails to say like, hey, if you happen to be using Latin 1 database, please go make sure you like go run this command and change your collation and blah, 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 right? So like for many frameworks just say to do that. This is, please copy and paste this into your database and it will hopefully work. 
Obviously, this is for for us that was untenable. Um, it leaks the fact that the encodings exist in the first place, and also like is an error prone operation. So. For us, it was basically go around and make sure all the popular database drivers are default internal, which means whatever the external data is, happens to be in, by the time it gets to Rails via one of these drivers, it will always be in UTF-8. So that solves the problem for database drivers, um, for, for things like Redis, MongoDB, et cetera. Um, what does that mean in practice? What it means in practice is that the MySQL database is some encoding. It could be like Russian. It could be Shiftis. Doesn't matter. It's whatever your database happens to be in. And then the MySQL 2 driver, which is what you should be using, not the MySQL driver, which does not do this correctly. Um, the MySQL 2 driver says, okay, I now, I got the bytes in, I see that it's ShiftGIS, so I'm gonna tag it to ShiftGIS, and then hey, I see that the user has specified a default internal, so I'm going to now ask Ruby to transcode those bytes over into UTF-8. And then it will give Ruby the UTF-8 bytes. Um, so then now Ruby has the right thing, and then we have, we have satisfied one vector for external data coming into Rails being in the right thing. And if you actually look at uh, Rails, you'll see that we are setting the default external and default internal to UTF-8. And that basically means that we are telling the world like, hey, if you, have, if you see data and you don't know what it is, assume it's UTF-8, um, which is basically just like people's editors usually save files in UTF-8. And um, if, you see, if you have data from an external source that is not already in UTF-8, please convert it to UTF-8 before you give it to Rails. Um, don't do this in libraries. Uh, so Rails is basically, a th there's like only one of Rails in a process. So we're basically saying like, here's what we want. If you're running like, you write like a CSV library or something, don't go and like set the default internal and external. That's actually a user setting. So you could imagine that like some Japanese user is like, oh, all my data's in shift -gis. They don't, you don't want like require faster CSV. Oh my God, all of a sudden my default external has changed. Um, it's okay for Rails to do it because Rails is a framework that's like running your process and does all kinds of stuff but you sh your library should not be randomly changing these settings. Yeah, we'll have to wrap it up. Okay. Almost done, I think. Uh, <laughs> templates. Yeah, so this is actually the last section is a section on templates. So um, basically what we do for templates, this easiest thing to do is like, okay, your templates are probably in default external, sounds good, we get the source, we make it def the default external and have a nice day. Um, except that we would like you to be able to say like, okay, actually it's Latin one. It's not, it's not uh, whatever the default external is. So you can put a magic comment at the top of your template file, which you can see over here, and then we'll make, do the right thing. Um, and there's also another case, um, which is both Hamel and ERB allow you to specify the encoding with a special magic comment. So in ERB, it's percent. Uh, percent not equals percent pound encoding UTF-8 in Hamel. It's equal. It's dash encoding UTF-8, and this is like in their documentation. So we needed to allow those things to still work. So there's like more work that we do here. Um, when we get a template from an extra, from the external source, we don't just believe that it's UTF-8 because we expect it to be. We make sure it's the right thing. Um, if it's not the right thing, we raise an exception which says like, hey, your template was not saved as UTF-8. Please go save it. Um, so we provide a much better error if your template happens to be you know, you happen to save it as Latin 1 in TextMate and you did the wrong thing. Um, and actually there's one more thing which is uh, browser data. Uh, so browser data is, that's the last vector of data getting into the system. And so actually HTML5 specifies, there's an accept car set flag you can put, uh, actually you can put on a form and it basically says, hey browser, please give me this data as UTF-8. And that theoretically should work. Theoretically should do the right thing. Unfortunately, if you actually look, parse the words of what IE does, IE says, if the user enters characters that are not in the character set of the document containing the form, the UTF-8 character set is used. I'm almost done. I'm <laughs> on like slide, yeah. Um, and basically the problem is the user changes the encoding to Latin 1, the user pays smart quotes from Microsoft Word, IE sees that the smart quotes are happening in Latin 1 and it ignores the accept car set. We do this thing where we put the check mark, user changes encoding to Latin 1, user pays smart quotes from Word, check mark is not in Latin 1, IE honors accept car set. So now we are in control. Uh, we basically make sure that encodings are all correct. Like I said before, you should not have to know any of these things. These are things that hopefully, uh, hopefully these are things that you use a framework that handles for you. You should not have to spend any time on this stuff. You should be focusing on the known knowns on the part of the app that's your app. And finally, what do you want to spend your time on? And I don't think I have time for questions. No, you. Oh, I do. I have time for questions. Okay, I have time for some questions.
uh, last unknown unknown part, I believe, uh, anybody who deal with uh, uh, UTF-8 in Ruby 1.8.7 knows this kitchen just a bit because before it was really horrible. Yep. Yeah, so the I, Ruby 1.9 actually gave us the tools for solving the problem. So everyone was like, Ruby 1.9, you suck at encodings. I hate you. Why, why do we need encodings? But actually, there was no way for us to do the right thing in 1.8 because we didn't have the tools to see what the encodings were. Um, so now in 1.9, you tend, people don't have replacement characters in their Rails apps, and people yeah, tend to not have Thank you very characters. much for this, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Okay, there's one more question over there. Yeah. Hi. Hey. <laughs> um, thanks for a great talk. Um, the weirdness with that middleware not being included is that Sinatra does not treat Ajax requests that save by default. Mm -hmm. Because that middleware, you would have to swap the cross-site request forgery middleware with that middleware in order to have Ajax requests saved by default. What is true, though, is that it's It doesn't on. include the other one either, though. It doesn't include either of the two CSRF ones by default. Uh, there are more than two. <laughs> Seems good. Um, no, but there's currently, I think, it's a vulnerability for referral spoofing. Yeah. So, by the way, I, I want to say, so, uh, Sinatra used to be a massively vulnerable framework. Like it used to basically have every possible web vulnerability. Um, good job having it not be massively vulnerable. Um, I think I, Sinatra should probably have a security list because you will want. It's good for people to like be able to report security bugs and you can see them. I, there is definitely a problem of like we have check 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 all the securities are checked off and then like new information comes out and there's no way to find out about it. Like you unless you're like constantly looking at all the security literature, you won't know. So. Cool. All right. Yeah, thank you. What, thank one more question. Oh, one more question. Ah, okay. okay. Quick, a quick one. If you uh, can. How did you come up with uh, the check mark as, the, uh, as a kind of a reference point for UTF-8? <laughs> uh, that was maybe one of the most bike shedded things ever. Um, so originally it was a snowman. So, okay, so, so the rule is it has to be a character that is in UTF-8, that is a Unicode character that is not in Latin 1. So it, you can't put like a E with a accent mark or anything. Um, so the first thing was a snowman. The idea was you would never see it, but get requests that, uh, forms that submit get requests make it show up in the URL. So people were like, oh my god, my site has been hacked. Why is there a snowman in my URL? <laughs> uh, so we basically spent a lot of time, and UTF-8 equals check is like semantically meaningful. You look at it, you're like, oh, UTF-8 equals check. I know what that means. It means UTF-8. Um, so basically, I, th I think that was a DHH idea, but the basic idea was just to have a thing that people would look at and not freak out and think their site was hacked, and that actually fits the bill. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's give you another hand.